Hey fellas, it's that time again. I'm Sergio. What's up? This is our story chat that we're doing today. Guys, I'm on location today in sunny Cancun, Mexico. And so this is going to be really fun. I want to wish you all a happy May the 4th. May the force be with you. And today, of course, the topic is going to be all Star Wars. And I want to take your questions. And also, I want to give a little bit of insight about the things that I learned when I was at Lucasfilm, and hopefully that'll help inspire you with some of the stuff that you're doing. And of course, we're going to talk a little bit about what makes Star Wars so special. So, uh, so yeah, let's get let's get right into it. I guess I should also remind you guys: this is Storyboard Art. What we do here, we train people on how to become awesome visual storytellers. If you're inter interested in making films, if you want to tell your stories, if you want to do anything that's visual storytelling related, that's what we're here for. We want to help you guys get to where you want to be. And it's not easy. It's not easy doing it. I had a long, hard, arduous uh, road in my career to actually learn the things that I need to learn and actually get better at it. And, you know, I feel I feel confident in the things that I do and I'm still learning every day. It's a process where you have to learn constantly and you just have to keep on it, keep on improving your skills. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So, yeah, we'll take your questions. So I'll get to that as, as much as possible uh, at the end. We're going to go for about half an hour. So this is going to be really, really fun. And the first thing I wanted to do, I was thinking about how I'm going to how I was going to prep this talk, because Star Wars is such a huge topic. There's so many things now in that universe. And what I was involved in, I guess I should remind people, is that um, back in 2006, I got hired to work on the Clone Wars um, animated series. And that was the first iteration of the 3D series that George Lucas launched when he was still uh, in charge of that company. And of course, Dave Filoni was heading that up, and I was one of, um, I, I ended up getting hired uh, about at the tail end of season one. So that was, uh, that was cool. It was, they had already started, but I, I got there really pretty much at the beginning. And I joined uh, the existing story team that was there and the directors, and it was awesome and wild experience. I was working at Skywalker Ranch. So that was really, really cool. I can talk a little bit about that because it was such a special and unique time to be involved with that. George was still part of that company and it was very much um, his vision of what we were doing on that show and also just everything in, in the company in general. What I learned there was how, you know, how detailed that vision really was. I, I didn't understand this until I came in and started working at Lucasfilm. So, um, and to give you, to give you guys an example, like it's not just, the projects that, that they would take on, there was this, there, there was this, um, there was this push to always do something new and and kind of um, yeah push the envelope so to speak. I mean that that phrase was was so common there because so many things came out of that that environment. So one of the things that we were working on was a a uh, previs tool. So for those of you guys, let me try and describe this. It was three D story three D storyboarding. OK, so it's it's telling storyboards instead of drawing it with your, you know, the traditional way where you do it on pencil and paper or you draw it on a digital tablet. We would use 3D stand in models and create the scenes that way. Now, we with the team, we developed a software that they still use today internally to do uh, a lot of their their 3D story, their previs, so to speak. So previsualization, this is a term that you might get you might hear get tossed around. But I, I really do think that we are pioneers. It's not um, too lofty to say that because I think everybody on, on, in the team uh, recognized what we were doing was so cutting edge. And nobody at the time was doing that because there, there, wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't budget for that. Only Big Man George could have um, that type of vision and, and be able to bankroll the, the technology that we needed to make this happen. And he did that with many other things, which is pr pretty amazing to think about. And I learned this as I, you know, as I joined that company. So he, um, they created Photoshop. If you guys know that, you know, the team there uh, was sponsored that Pixar came out of Lucasfilm. Uh, what else was part of that? Avid, which is the nonlinear editing system, which is an amazing story. If you think about it back in the day, George needed to find a way, a, a better way to edit. And he said, well, I'm, I'm sure there was m multiple people involved, but kind of one of the, the stories that's told is that he was just trying to figure out a, a way to edit. And they created the Avid system, which is a non-linear editing tool, which was revolutionized the way that you do editing and filmmaking. So you, you basically digitize that. Now it's like a given that you would do that. But that all started 
uh, had had its origins at Lucasfilm. So there's all kinds of things that came out of that. And one of the things that I got involved with was um, the Clone Wars series, and then I moved on to the Rebels um, animated series, and then uh, the Resistance animated series. And then I was in the story department, and uh, we learned the way in which we had to film for those things that would reflect the Star Wars style. So that's some of the things that I wanted to talk about today with that. So what does that mean? Is that there's a certain cinematic language that Star the Star Wars universe has. Now, with the new additions of what happened, like episode um, seven, eight, and nine, uh, they have expanded on that. And you know, with the Mandalorian, they have expanded on that. I think, in fact, Mandalorian would probably bring it back into the more classic way that of of the Star Wars filmmaking. That's probably one of the reasons why um, it's so popular. And I think uh, you know, part of that is is Dave and and what he learned directly from George and how to film and do that stuff. And then, of course, his own personal tastes, um, and you know, John Favreau um, definitely involved with that. With that, but um, I know, I know this personally from working with Dave. Is that the way they shot, the way that the ships moved, the 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 way the characters developed was all very much a reflection of what was done before and from George Lucas. Now, for whatever you guys think about some of the projects that they've done, I think uh, the respect that I give it is the the innovation that came out of that and the sheer creativity and the expanse of that universe. So that I think is, is something to take note of. Now I want to also mention um, while working at Skywalker, you can't imagine <laughs> how inspiring it is to be at, a, at a, a running production studio that is the most beautiful, just like golf club, clubhouse type ranch that you can be in. It's a, literally a working ranch. There's cows and there's deer. They have a vineyard and uh, all of that there, there's a big lake. But within that, it's a working facility. So you have the tech building, which houses all of the post-production audio, and it's got a huge sound stage. It's got a, a movie theater for screening. There's the main house, which uh, has George's offices. I mean, I don't, I don't know if they still have this, but this was what, what we were doing back in the day. So these things might've changed right now um, because uh, that, that facility constantly evolves. Uh, at any rate, we were working out of the carriage house back then, which was another building annex to the series of buildings that were in that complex. And, you know, we, we would <laughs> you'd literally ride a bike from one building to the other to go, you know, uh, uh, you know, play squash, you know, and tennis <laughs> during lunchtime. It was so amazing. We jump in the pool. We played soccer. It was so much fun to be there with a bunch of knucklehead artists <laughs> but we were, we were all very serious about what we were doing and there was nothing you know i remember working very late there and one of the times the security guard came in i think it was midnight and he did his rounds and like i was almost startled that he came into the room he came into the office that, that i was working in and so it was really dark you know we're at this secluded ranch and it's just me and my computer working there and he comes in and says, hey hey how you doing you know, just do my rounds. Everything okay? Yeah, sure, great. And then, <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm almost done. I'll, I'll get out of here pretty soon. Eh, no problem. And uh, and you move on. So the you know, there's a it's a working production facility, but it it had a very unique and special place. And then they do a lot of movie screenings there. There's there's a lot of anecdotes I can talk about, but I really want to mention some of the the things that might help you guys get uh, some stuff done. So I brought up this, and let me bring this up on my laptop here. I got my notes down below. Uh, let me pull this up. These are the, the the flight rules from from Star Wars, and I this is part of the Story Artist Mentorship that is one of the the programs that we sponsor to help train people. It's kind of our premier flagship program, and uh, those of you guys who are in it get access to this stuff. And this is a uh, a document that I compiled based on the notes that they gave us for the flight rules and in the Star Wars universe and. You know, I don't think there's any big secret. If you really analyze what's going on there, uh, you will notice how they do this. So the, the ships in Star Wars fly like uh, World War II uh, fighter planes, okay? And there's a, couple of, there's a couple of special things that happen there. So the planes are propelled as if they have a propeller on the front and they're, they're, being, uh, they're being dragged through the air, okay? Or dragged through space. That's the way they fly. They're, as opposed to a jet, which is being pushed through the air, okay? So, um, 
So there's a big difference between the way a jet plane flies and a propeller plane fly, flies. And this is very much reflected in kind of the, the, the flight rules and the dog fights that you would have um, in, in Star Wars and in Clone Wars, okay? So a, a couple of rules that would happen is that when a ship enters, it's a very clean ent entrance, and you also want a clean exit. So George doesn't like things that were cut off. And I think he was, he was smart on this. He wants you know, at maximum clarity when it comes to the flight path of these ships. Also that when you, when you turn, you don't just turn on a dime like you probably actually would in space, <laughs> right? You, the flight rules are very much like they're air propelled. So the flight, the, the ship will bank first before it turns and goes off screen, okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> and pay attention when you're watching Star Wars and some of the space battles, that's the way they unfold. Now, rules are meant to be broken. You're probably gonna find scenes where this doesn't always play out. But I think the more famous ones, especially back in, in the films, and certainly what we were doing on Clone Wars, we, we stuck very rigidly to this because it, it helped the style of what we were doing to, to make it really, really great, okay? <laughs> let me go to the next page here. Well, let me see, let me read this over and see if there's any points that I wanna pull out. Um, yeah, a couple of, th another thing to, to, to keep in mind here is that, so think of uh, fighter planes, jet planes in the air, you know, as if they're, they're flying, okay? Imagine this in space. Now, if you're gonna film this, think of how you would actually do this practically. You you wouldn't necessarily have a floating camera that's just you know, floating in space. You'd have to have a another camera plane, essentially, right? The camera is, is attached to a plane that's following your subject, okay? And it's following at, a, at probably um, a similar rate, okay? So there's a similar velocity. So that that whole theory of how they did the camera work is very important. So the camera's not just going everywhere. It's actually uh, flying on a, a similar flight path and if it's if it's going to turn and bank, it's also the the camera plane would also turn and bank as well. So the camera is going to reflect that kind of movement, and you would all do this in space. And the types of lenses that we use uh, would reflect that as well. Uh, I think we didn't go. Uh, we were encouraged not to go larger than a seventy-five millimeter. I know we got. We sometimes we go off the handle and do what we wanted uh, on the story team and play around with the camera lenses, but uh, when it came to actually um, shooting this in a more traditional way, you want to use like a 75 millimeter lens. I think it was 50 to 75 millimeter. Now the, the cockpit shots when you're in inside, we wouldn't want to go uh, wider than a 24. And that was what was shot in, in the cockpits uh, inside of Star Wars. Now I've heard stories as well of the actual set of the uh, Millennium Falcon, for example, and some of the other ships that they're very small. They're very much just like an, an airplane cockpit. And so that's where they would have to fit the camera in there. They wanted that feel to make it, you know, feel like it's it's almost like an airplane, but it's really not a spaceship. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So let me go on to um, the next page here. Yeah, this is just flight reference. Now, uh, I know there's a bunch of YouTube links. This is a handout that we give our, our mentorship students so they can go and do some research. But a couple of things to point out here, like the Red Baron and uh, the Battle of Britain and the dogfights, the classic World War II dogfights, that's something that uh, we would research and that you know it's encouraged to understand how those things actually flew so that we could reflect that in, in spaceships, right? You, you, you wouldn't think so. This is also like kind of, uncommon uh, common sense, so to speak, that, you know, when you look at it, you, it probably registers as like, yeah, it's cool how they fly, but it's not this like whipping around and zipping and, and ducking like, like Battlestar Galactica does, um, which was actually a cool spinoff of the way that ships are flying. So you can tell the difference between the, the BSG universe and the Star Wars universe just by the way that the ships are flying, right? Now, the other cool thing is that, you know, I had my training in these like space battles and how to figure it out. So I, I learned, I, you know, I was taught this stuff by, by really the experts who really knew how to set up a, a shot in 3D with, with all the nodes and like the, the attachments and getting everything working. And you can do a really, really cool complex shot in Maya or any one of these 3D uh, programs 
the one that they have at, at Lucasfilm for 3D storyboarding is pretty slick. But I learned all that stuff and it's so cool and wild to do that. Now there were, I will say there are some really cool experts and one of our guys, David, who's helping us out with the mentorship as well, uh, they call him Flyboy <laughs> because he just became an amazing flight expert and the shots, I remember he, he was on one of my teams um, for when I was directing on, uh, on Rebels and you know, I would just hand him the space battle and he just figured it out. I mean, it was, I really didn't have to do much. Like he knew, you know, we'd have a little discussion about, okay, what happens here? The ship goes in that way. And then he just went to town because he knew what he was doing. He understood these flight rules. He understood the timing, the way the ships would, would, would come in and come out. And then he also had an eye for an exciting, or he has an eye for an exciting, um, an exciting scene. So that's, that's really cool when you can trust uh, a story artist like that. And I, I encourage you guys to be the same way that you, you fully take ownership of the scenes that you're working on. And that, uh, you know, after a while you actually get confidence, you're going to be able to do this. All right. So let me just see. And that's it. That's this a, a really quick slide, um, of the, the flight rules. And with that, I think, um, yeah, we're halfway into this. So I'm, I'm going to take your, I'm going to take your questions now and, and see what you guys have on your mind. So I have a ton of other anecdotes and stories I could tell about of working at, at Skywalker and also at, at the Presidio, uh, which is where we did Rebels and Resistance. So that, that's something that's super cool. Let me go down here. It's great to see everybody, by the way. I should, I'm, I'm so happy that you guys could join us. Well, we're doing these talks a little bit more regularly now. And, you know, what else have you guys done? Maybe that's a question I should throw out. Did you do anything special for May the 4th? <laughs> you hardcore Star Wars fans, I bet you did. All right. <laughs> cool. All right, let me just scan this list here. and see what we got going. Cool. Yeah, this is great. Hey, JC, what's up, buddy? I want to bring your stuff up on screen because this is a great comment. The model makers that were on Battlestar Galactica, if I recall, were the same guys that worked on Star Wars and Emperor Strikes Back. That is rad. Uh, I didn't know that. And those guys are just amazing. I mean, that's another thing I should mention about Star Wars. It just, that whole, that whole, uh, uh, franchise attracted and attracts so much talent. It really does. Uh, huge, huge artisans and craftsmen and filmmakers of all types are working at their top, at their best. And to see that um, reflected in the work there is so, so amazing. I, you know, it makes me think of, and I'll tell this little anecdote story. I got a tour of the, of the archives building at Skywalker Ranch. And I think, you know, if I heard from through the grapevine that this will eventually make its way into the museum that, that George Lucas is planning. I hope that's still in the works. I don't, I lost, um, I lost the beat on that. But at any rate, I did get a tour of the archives building and it was just mind blowing, the stuff that I saw, it really, really was. So how, how do I describe this? Okay, I saw the Death Star, I saw like the maquettes and the models. The stuff that impressed me the most is, is the concept paintings and the concept art that I saw, the originals. I saw Ralph McQuarrie originals. I saw uh, original matte paintings that are painted huge on glass. So if you don't know what a matte painting is, they used to, they used to do a special effect trick where they would, they would only film uh, a certain part of the background and the rest of it would be all be black. Somebody else would come in and fill that in with a, with a painting. They would literally paint it in, in colors, like by hand. And this would be uh, filmed as well. And it would all be, combined onto um onto one plate of of film essentially they'd use a um uh and i forgot what it's called now somebody help me out but the, it was basically the the way that they um they combined these visual effects manually to create that illusion and they did that in many 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 films of course star wars was one that used a lot of visual effects so it got famous for that i saw those original bad paintings are just just mind-blowing so the, the original roth mccary stuff and I, I must admit that um, the Ralph McQuarrie's, uh, I didn't have a full appreciation of Ralph McQuarrie's work until I saw those originals. Now I had seen a lot of his designs and you know, they're impressive, but I tell you, when you see the actual originals and they're, you know, they're decent size, maybe 11 by 17 gouache paintings and, you know, acrylic paintings, just top notch, amazing, amazing, amazing. Huge juggernaut that guy is, okay? <laughs> Um, 
Hey, buddy, thanks for this. Hey, Shadow Jacked is, is here. When handling things like lightsaber duels, what kind of rules do you have to adhere to? Uh, yeah, the, you know, there's similar stuff there. We had a little bit of leeway when doing the lightsaber battles. Now, think of that as swashbuckling, classic sword fight, okay? There, there were things that, like, uh, you definitely want to have a strong pose, and none of this, like, like throwing the – you couldn't really – this was actually one of the things that we – wanted to do a lot of it was discouraged to like throw the lightsaber because that's like a very sacred tool that these these jedi would fight with okay so it's a it's a tool that you have to wield very heavily right even though you know it's made of light essentially but um that it has weight to it and so those are the some of the things that you had to do and choreograph out and again there were a lot of really um fun action scenes that i got to do uh, using that and I, I always wanted to do my own twist on it i ended up doing like a little bit more kung fu uh martial arts mix of of a lightsaber battle um and there are a lot of amazing experts on there one of the guys that i always looked up to was Stuart lee who's uh one of the most amazing you know fight choreographers uh out there he's just great <laughs> uh cool yeah this is thanks jc did some fan art for for today and then uh, Thurman is saying here, working on a, a Kit Fisto sketch uh, since it's, it's, a, it's a mermaid too. Yeah, that's right. I like Kit Fisto. That guy's awesome. All right, let me look through some of these, um, some more of these questions. A JSEO0348, what kind of rules in world building or army rules? You know, this is actually a really cool question that you bring up here because in talking about Star Wars, th that's a universe that has that has its own rules. Okay, so it's it's really a good idea to establish these things and follow them. Right. One of the things that we would do is like you couldn't necessarily just zip around in hyperspace from one place to the other. It was it was like a, a technology that. Um, that uses energy, right? So it wasn't just like click a button, you could do it over and over and over and over again. So it had to have a deliberate way of, of, of showing it. And then also had a, a deliberate arrival and exit. So that was one of the things that you couldn't just go from one planet to another and then just cut to there. You have to introduce the planet that you're going to. And so this is all part of the rules that we would follow as we're doing these, these episodes. And that's a really good idea. So if you're, if you're coming up with your own story and you talk about army or uh, maybe an adventure or something like that, um, then you know, what you wanna do is actually think through how these things would operate. You know, what if it's a, let's say, just use that army example. If it's an army, what kind of an army is it? Is it a foot soldier? Or is it, um, is it more of like uh, a modern, army which has technology and tanks and you know you, you have a lot of vehicles going and then what kinds of things are are going to be involved in the, in the types of battles that they're going to have to get into so all of this may you want it to make sense because if it's not believable your audience will pick you out uh right away it's the audiences are so sophisticated and just think of the movies that you've watched and you know maybe there's couples recently i bet that you know, there's always some action films that come out and that you know have to do with science fiction or some kind of world building and you look at it and you're like well that doesn't quite make sense why do they do that and it's it just it occurs to you instantly but you think that these filmmakers would have figured it out it's actually quite hard so those are some of the things i just encourage you to do a lot of research and really think hard about what you're trying to do and then also show others you know that'll point them out um that'll help help um I'll point out your errors or some of the holes that you're doing, okay? Hey, Joseph Garcia, thanks, buddy. Yeah, exactly, I'm talking about the optical printer. See, it's so it's such an ancient tool nowadays <laughs> that this is how they combine the things back in the day. So in a, in a giant, uh, uh, how do you put this? In a, in, a, in a combination of, in a big machine that combines multiple plates of film, you would, you would actually print out one one uh, composite okay and that's well kind of where the name compositing comes from now it's all done digitally and so much easier even bat paintings are digital matte paintings now so those are all things um, to do all right this is a good one too 
Uh, Jennifer Griller here is asking, is there a difference in storyboarding for other movie companies? Yes, absolutely. So what, you know, I, I have, I've worked on many different projects over my career and from comedy to action, to drama, uh, live action movies, to commercials and all the way through. And I, I spent in total, I think it was about six or seven years at Lucasfilm and you know, we, you have to learn the way that they do it and their method. Okay. And it gets passed down for the people that have already done it before. That's why it's so kind of cool that somebody like Lucas established the vision. He wanted a certain way of which it would look. And then after that, um, you're supposed to follow and execute that vision, right? That's really what you want to be doing. And every company is going to be different. So if you're working at Pixar, you have a different set of rules and a different set of guidelines and maybe the way you know characters move or objects or ships or or vehicles are going to be totally different and it should really be for that particular project and really reflect it you know that's something that's more of being honest to the subject that you're doing and this is all you know really part of doing your research and being a pro so that that's something that's that's pretty cool um hey paul has a question here hey buddy uh hope all is well everything's good thanks for asking <laughs> what's a typical work day like um whether you want story team or directed at the ranch or the presidio <laughs> that's a wonderful question let me think you know there were times where you get into a grind and it became very much work but let me let me give you a typical scenario for for skywalker ranch uh you know i commuted up north from where i lived in san francisco and so it took me about an hour to get there. It's pretty remote. Um, you go up this, this windy road and, and you get into this amazing, amazing facility. And of course, you know, first thing I would do there is just, you know, open up my computer, say hi to everybody on the team, you know, the people that you run into in the office. And then just you sit down and work. They're usually the tasks that you have, um, you know, they're already outlined and you're, you're on a really rigid schedule. Okay. So then after that, um, you know, you got a lunch break. And to me, my, that lunch break was so super fun. And I would do a number of things. I remember well, one of the ones I used to love going to the fitness center because there were so many activities there. It was like basketball. You could go swimming in the pool, you know, go exercise in the weight room. Um, a lot of the guys were awesome at, at squash. And uh, I was never really good at squash. It always destroyed me. Um, I just remember today I was thinking about this because I saw a table. Um, we became really good at ping pong. I can kick ass in ping pong. <laughs> and... Uh, uh the, anyway there's the number of like recreational things that we did we played soccer but then the afternoon block would be um again grinding out work and we'd go all the way you know i remember just getting dark so i'd go to like seven you know sometimes eight o'clock you, you know usually that that was my hours and then i'd, I'd, I'd roll on home uh, for another commute presidio was very similar uh it was closer to where i lived so there was um uh you know, maybe less of that, like lunchtime recreation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, although there's still like plenty to do around the Presidio. So this is, this is the work environment that was built up there. It's so awesome. You, you really have that camaraderie with the other, with the other artists. And uh, it, it is very serious though. So when you have deadlines, um, it might sound cool that, Hey, it's all fun and stuff, but what the, the fun comes in actually putting your heart and soul into the project and making it amazing. That that's really what, it comes down to yes i had fun playing soccer <laughs> i remember those times too but uh i remember more the challenges that i had in in the story department learning the things that i needed to learn and it was uh, it's a challenge it, it it is very difficult and when you when you put your your heart into it that is you know makes it even that much more because you're, you're kind of like you're you're putting all your heart and soul into it and you want it to come out good Sometimes you get the results you want, sometimes you don't. So this is all <laughs> the part of the learning process. The times that you don't, you gotta figure out why. And then you, you know, you improve and you go on. And that's why you have other people there. You got supervisors, you got people that come in and give you comments. And that's very, very helpful. You gotta be able to filter and understand what they're telling you so that you can apply it. Sometimes those comments are rough and it's painful because it's like I said, you're putting your heart and soul into it and they destroy your the work or they give you some very pointed but honest feedback. And if that, if it's on, if it's right, and if, it, if they're actually accurate, then, you know, you should pay attention. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks. A great question there. Hope I, hope I answered that, Paul. Okay. Uh, 
let me bring up let me bring up this one <laughs> uh, from Jennifer. This was kind of a follow-up from what you're saying. There's specific, uh, unique things about Star Wars and the storytelling that happened there. Yeah, this is kind of one of the topics I want to talk about today um, in that the way that you, the filmmaking that you had there is very different from a uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles type show, right? Or from SpongeBob, okay? And what we were trying to mimic was a live action and very cinematic feel. In fact, on Clone Wars, we had a two, three, five aspect ratio was that very long cinematic aspect ratio. And the, so what we had to do is have accurate lenses, had really strong compositions. And we also had to have really good and engaging staging. That's very common in a dramatic scene. You couldn't just wing it and have flat like cartoon staging because, you know, maybe in like a SpongeBob show, the comedy is what really comes out. And, you know, I love SpongeBob. So it's like uh, they, what they're focusing on is to make things funny, maybe make it snappy. What's in a Star Wars show, you want to make it more dramatic and uh, exciting visually. Visually, that's one of the things about visual storytelling. You want to keep it really on screen. You want to tell people um, the story through the images. You don't want to just have a dialogue conversation have them tell what's going on you want to show it right show not tell that was very very much encouraged and one of the things i remember early on when i when i started up on clone wars i asked uh, some of the the technical supervisors there i said well are there any limitations to what we can do with the camera if i come up with a shot um that you know has uh, a lot of camera moves or a comp complex staging in there is there is there something i should know about so that I don't go overboard. And they, they, the response was like, no, you know, you come up with, <laughs> you come up with a shot, you come up with a scene. And if it works, we're, we're able to execute it for you. And that's, that was so awesome for me to hear that uh, we we're at a place that was uh, giving you that freedom to be able to really um, explore the filmmaking. Now within that, of course, you couldn't just do anything and have explosions going off or thousands of characters involved there was a limit to the amount, the amount of animation that we could do in a particular episode and I, I did get my hand slapped a couple times when i tried to do really long extended shots i think i did like a two minute shot once and they say well it's a little bit too long you should cut this up <laughs> you know i thought it looked really cool at any rate i gave it my best <laughs> all right um hey this one's great now i think it's probably a good one to end on hey joe good to see you buddy um is there a memory of a story problem or solution that you would do differently today? And I, I think, let me think on that one. There, I don't really, there's nothing that really stands out in particular as like one moment, but I'll, I'll give you an example of things that I, I was, I was really trying to do the cool factor along the lines of what I just mentioned of like making it visual and have visual storytelling. Okay. But there is a point of going too far that you're, you're covering up the substance with technique. And I mentioned this uh, often in some of the talks that we do and, and, and guiding some of the students that we have, because it should be based on substance. It should be based on the character relationships and what's going on. So for example, um, I would do these long extended camera takes where I, I was purposely trying uh, to do one or shots or, you know, to see if I could, could outdo the next guy or, you know, you know, the next story artist, because I just wanted to do something cool. And then looking back in some of those shots and like, huh, you know, yeah, that might have a, some cool appeal, but that I would probably do it different today because I, I don't want to call out the camera work. I don't want to call out the special effect. I want the, the acting and the character relationship to really come through. And this, I think, comes from, a, a, I would just chalk this up a little bit more maturity. Like now that I'm, you know, at where I am in my career and, and kind of the filmmaking style, I'm less of the flash and I'm less of like, okay, let's make it cool, snappy, fast, fun, boom, bang. And more of like, okay, where can we make somebody really feel the emotion? Where can I draw out that emotion? And that's where um, I'm more about that stuff too. Now I still want it to be cool, so I don't want it to go boring, but I also want it to make it 
awesome, right? So that's some of the things that I think um, I would do uh, maybe maybe differently now. Uh, but hey, this you know you do your best at the time, and if that is, you know, if you can't ask for anything more than your best, if you if you really give your all, then you've done your job, okay? And if you still have more to learn, well, that's it. You you know you just you try and do better the next time. But at that moment in your in your life in your career, that was the best you could do. You put your heart and soul into it. Looking back on it, that's where you got to come your critical eye and say, "Well, Sergio, when he was you know 28 or whatever, <laughs> I think I was like my I think I started when I was like 30 at Lucasfilm. Um, looking back and being like, okay, well, my 30 year old self, uh, you know, was would do this, but now that I'm I'm older, you know, I would probably try something differently. And that just comes with having more tools in your tool belt, <laughs> so to speak. All right. Well, I think that's, that's a great question to end on. Thank you guys for, for participating on that. Uh, I, I do want to point again, uh, a lot of the updates that we've done on our website are just, just some really cool content. And I was talking about that with our team today. I really think it's some kick-ass stuff. So I encourage you guys to go up to storyboardart.org, check out what we have there on our updated website. and. Um, you can see a lot of the coursework that we're doing and, you know, some of the insider stuff that I just shared with you today, unfortunately you, you can only get it if you actually sign up to, um, to a membership to our, to our courses. And that's actually going to be opening up pretty soon, uh, coming up in June. So stay tuned for more announcements there. We got some really, really exciting things planned, uh, for the future. So I, thanks again for joining me. I wish you guys all an awesome May the 4th. So may the force be with you and, uh, and keep those awesome Keep those awesome things going. And uh, if you have any, any topics or questions, we want to hear about it. All right, you guys, enjoy your May the 4th. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.